And we're live. <laughs> Let me hear you, Lizzie. <laughs> What's that? Let me hear you. Mm, testing, Talk testing, nice testing. and into it. Yeah, you can like nice you can you can make it. out with that mic. Mm, okay. There you go. That sounds great. Condenser mic. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello. Good morning. So yeah, we, we we were having so much fun yesterday with you, Lucy, that we thought we'd have you again. <laughs> because we never we didn't even get to the main subject of your newest film. Series, series. It's hours of it. And also, this is something that I've always tried to get Patrick to talk about, but he won't because he thinks uh, it'll it, it's too controversial. It'll tarnish his. Uh, my my uh, ever tarnishing uh, and receding neuroscience reputation. Yeah. <laughs> well, so it's it, okay. Look, it's Why? a thing. I mean, I I can actually talk about this. Like, I guess the way that I think about it is like, um, um, I was one time actually asked to be kind of the scientific expert on a paranormal television show, right? And so they wanted to know, like, is there plausible, you know, like, how do, how do we assess the merit of the science about kind of ghosts and aliens and unexplained phenomena and metaphysical things? But it's fundamentally the case that, like, even if you're the critical denier of the ghosts and the aliens and you just say, no, the science doesn't exist, like, there's nothing, these are all completely um, um, explainable by other much more plausible means, you're still on the show about aliens and science. There's still an associational thing. Human brains, social primates, we are associational, we are transitive. And it is simply the case that like, there, it's, it's a kind of scientist who kind of publicly talks about this. And there is a reputational, I don't think it's a hit necessarily, but you become a kind of niche branded. It's part of brand. Everyone's building a brand in your career, right? right. And you become branded. And, and maybe there's a kind of confidence where when you are kind of unimpeachably, unimpeachably in the field of neuroscience, you can kind of speak about anything at all times. But I don't think that's true for anyone in any field. Like that takes a ve that's a very rare, small, small percentage of people that can talk about anything at all times. Like I'm sure there are controversial topics maybe within film that you guys feel a little bit sensitive talking about. And not necessarily film as film or film as the medium, but the people involved or the gossip involved or the, the, the industry dark arts or something like that. And so like I do think that there's a way in which, um, especially in this country, psychedelics and science about psychedelics and the social impact of psychedelics is wrapped together in this. It's not just scientific. It's cultural. It's personal. It's legal. It, there are a lot of different layers and, and levels to it, and you're getting mixed up in quite a bit of it. But you can you you could kind of dissociate and talk just about the science, and dissociate from all the other kind of cultural impact or layers. To me, this shows but it just, just doesn't the, work. It just shows how enmeshed uh, scientists who pretend to be objective, you know, seekers of truth, are in, you know. In politics, there's in, no, in no a type one, of politics. No I'd one thinks subject to, I'd, I'd say subject to, I think the tragedy is that scientists are often really impacted by politics for their career. I mean, that's the story I keep hearing, is that, um, that scientists, the prohibition against, for example, researching psychedelics, it's not um, that you can't, it's just that you're never going to get funded. There's a reputational risk, and also there's a yeah, re there's research will not get funded absolutely. unless your research is to show the harms of a drug. Until extremely recently, you would never get funding. In fact, um, for anything ever again, sort of a thing. And um, well, that would be the anxiety and possibly the reality. And you would, I think, to this day, no um, a positive sounding um, psychedelic research has been um, funded by the traditional funding methods. It's private philanthropy yeah. that is funding these studies, which is astonishing because the, the the stuff that is being shown is so beneficial to society, like depression and anxiety and all these um, PTSD, all these uh, indications that really cost um, governments huge amounts of money and cost, um, you know, humans so much happiness and... and um, Lucy, do me a favor. Try and get your mic. Yeah, yeah. Like trying to really here, close. I should it, speak up. Yeah, move it to closer to you, and maybe even down a little bit because it's also covering your face. Mm. And then move it this this way a little bit. That's probably going to be much better. Okay. Oh yeah. Now we're talking. All right. Thank you. Go on. So so th can you? I know you're not allowed to say everything about your film that you're working on, but can it's you? It's a series, but I can't talk about what it is. Yeah. Can you but tell I can us talk what about it is? Yeah. 
Uh, well, I've been I've been fascinated with psychedelics my whole life, and always wanted to share that. And I think it's um, a time now where we can kind of come out about our psychedelic experiences without um, reputational risk. So, as filmmakers, if not yet. As I think as neuroscientists, I think Patrick may be shy too. Still, I think some yeah. people feel that way, yeah, but yeah. I think we're on. A the lot of brink. people feel much more confident talking about it than I do. But it's not—it's not my primary research as well. So it's like, a, um, like, I just simply uh, there are more things about like w when I speak about it, I'm speaking about it as a person. I guess that makes sense. And but often in my in a public persona, you're speaking kind of as the quasi scientist, as the quasi person. I'm happy to talk about my subjective experiences with it. And what about this T-shirt you're wearing? We can discover the wonders of your mind with a s Grateful Dead looking skull oh, inside of know. a skull instead of a skull. Is I that found on purpose it at a, today? I found it at a thrift store in LA uh, a couple <laughs> days ago. It's one of my only clean shirts. It's a good one though. <laughs> it seems apropos. <laughs> Oh yeah, I was wearing it on yesterday. On the nose, literally on the nose. No, it's the same shirt I was wearing yesterday. It was not apropos then. And it's a coincidence. Your yeah. your your meaning making. <laughs> <laughs> Always. It's uh, not a coincidence, though, Patrick. Is it? It says we can discover the wonders of your, your mind. mind. Okay, maybe it's not a, entirely a coincidence. <laughs> and on the back it says Wonderland Social Club, which is kind of less interesting. But the we can discover the wonders of your mind, the picture of the brains is very All right, yeah, Patrick. Yeah. It's, it's on brand. Yeah, it's that's on certainly brand. true. It's on brand. Yeah. And I think that's what you do. I, I think that that's what you give us, Patrick. You discover the wonders of our minds. And we thank you for that. You're welcome. So, but uh, what, why did, were you always interested in psychedelics? You said you were. What's more interesting? I think that they um, uh, are fascinating experiences and the way that they perturb consciousness shows us so much about the mind. Um, I think it's Stan Groff who said that psychedelics are, um, are you know, what, uh, I'm going to totally bungle this quote, but what um, the telescope was for astronomy and the microscope was for um, biology, psychedelics are for the study of the mind. And I think that's true. You know, how, how do we understand consciousness? I think we're learning so much from psychedelics and uh, so much um, about the brain and just in incredible discoveries, I think, are going to come from uh, this line of research. Also, the, to me, just the fact that you can take such a small amount of something, LSD is measured in millionths of a gram, right? It's not... Micrograms, Micrograms, exactly. not like... A, and so the fact that you can take this really minuscule amount of something, and then obviously then it's going through, your, you're putting it in your mouth, and it's, it's that's being diluted, I'm sure, somewhat before it reaches your brain, right? And the fact that that can so drastically change our experience and our perception of the world, it must say something about the kind of contingency of the way your brain is kind of, you know, set up chemically. The fact that such a small amount of change can so drastically alter our experience. Doesn't that in and of itself, without even going through the experience, just that fact, doesn't that say something about what brain chemistry is? I don't think so because, um, like, to, or to me, the, that, that scale argument um, doesn't, doesn't do much for me because you could just if we stopped eating with I mean, in 24 hours we'd be hungry right right and we'd be probably Less anxious and that. angry or whenever it is <laughs> we'd, we'd get we'd get upset at some point our mood would change mm -hmm. so by doing nothing you can change your mood by holding your breath you can change your mood so it has like that's 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 to argue that you can actually I I imbibe zero things and right. your mood changes. So the fact that like a microgram of a thing changes uh, some other aspect of your mood to me doesn't. It's not. It's not that remarkable. Well, like, it's not just your mood. It's your entire perception of the world. The whole world appears different. Right. So we. But we can also like, um, you know. I, I guess I think about like the the chromatin reorganization in a cell, or like a gene rewiring. You know, after a couple of weeks, like which is tiny, m much, much, much tinier than uh, a, a microgram of LSD. You know that will completely change your receptor profile on your cells, which will then completely change your experience of the world, also. So, like something much, much smaller, dendrites and receptors and these things that are constantly changing, also has an effect on your consciousness. So, relative to this, the micrograms of the kinds of dosages of psychedelics that we take are huge; they're astronomical. So, like it's already the case that nanoscale things can change conscious and subjective perception. 
if you kind of zoom in far enough. So it's not that surprising to me that but what other substances so potent? It, it is shockingly potent. And they've just discovered, haven't they? But micrograms? They've uh, just uh, discovered the... Um, Novichek, the polonium, the micrograms, poison. Micrograms, again, micrograms. It's yeah, very small amounts. Absolutely, but um, there there are many toxins, venoms. Uh, uh, you know, this is the Russian kind of nerve poison agent. You just yeah, you know, like I know, but I don't think anything else carfentanil, is I think Carfentanil, that's you touch it and you're dead. Really? I mean, so like, like it's, yeah. So like, I, I guess I just, we, the scale argument doesn't matter too much, but like it doesn't, I don't see beauty in the smallness of the dose, I guess, in terms of its in effect on a biological it be, organism. It's, it's a, it's an extremely good fit for the serotonin 2A receptor. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And they've discovered it in the way it sort of sits in there and then gets trapped in there. Um, it's sort of unique. And the t 2A receptor is very interesting and um, for lots of reasons. Um, but they're all interesting. All the receptors are interesting. Sorry, I'm just going to be the... I, like, I... I they're... Lucy. I think they're extremely interesting telescopes into the mind psychedelics um, I think they can perturb the brain and the brain as it is normally working in ways that absolutely teach us like under the hood in the same way that you go in and you like tinker with a, a kind of a piece of the engine you know in a car to learn how it works a perfectly functioning smooth car you never even think about it perfectly functioning smooth brain you never think about it right but the I think I think a large majority of the majesty and beauty of the evolution and the like put togetherness of the mammalian brain and kind of nervous systems across the world has to do with the their normal working. I think the normal working of the human brain is where everything is. And so perturbing it gives you small small windows into that normal working. But I think to 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 highlight only the orthogonal kind of ways that you can break it down or the ways that you can change it removes some of the majesty of the fact that there's still miracles happening in the normal working operation. Everybody that can walk around functionally is effectively uh, across the entire expanse of the universe, just like a complete statistical anomaly that should be just worshipped. And you're saying even and even when we're like tripping our minds out the fact that we're still breathing and walking around and able to function and be alive you're saying is still 99 percent the iceberg yeah of of uh of what it is what the brain is doing is still you're saying fundamentally unperturbed right i think you've said this to me in other conversations outside of like dissociatives which i think are uh, extremely interesting in terms of what they can tell us about like self and body and mind yeah i think Oh, we got to teach you some more stuff, Patrick. <laughs> I don't think you know half of what's interesting. It's fascinating. And you there, you're interested in consciousness. Mm -hmm. What else tells you more about consciousness than psychedelic experiences and psychedelic studies that they're just getting into? Uh, the fact that we uh, obliterate our consciousness every evening and then just wake up as if that's normal. Alcohol is not that interesting. No, sleep. 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 Oh, sleep. I see what you mean. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <Just> obliterate our <laughs> consciousness. <laughs> no. Well, okay, yeah. I don't think that's obliteration of consciousness because sleep is a rich um, experience for me in which my consciousness is there. Anesthetic is a different case. And Il Seth talks very interestingly about an anesthetic experience. When you wake up from an anesthetic, you have no sense of how much time has passed. Mm -hmm. You know, they put you out, you count back from 10, and the next thing you know, you're in the recovery room or what, or what, 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 whatever. But if you sleep, you, you studies show, and one's experience is, that you have a pretty good uh, understanding of how, how long you've been asleep for because you haven't obliterated your consciousness. There's a lot of it that's online and doing important, beautiful things like dreaming consolidating memory all these beautiful yeah activities. patrick yeah <laughs> mr contrary contrary i mean yes. there are stages of sleep where you're uh, uh, behaviorally functionally and uh, kind of like physiologically well you're not dead like the, you, you you drop this stone in the pond and there's still a few ripples but you know you're gone you're out and i mean i, I i'm not saying that um one is more or less interesting. I just want to elevate the fact that there are a lot of interesting things that happen to the normal brain that are equally interesting as perturbations induced by psychedelics. 
Yeah, that's that's, that's okay. All. It doesn't all. take away from, yeah, from it, it being interesting. No. The fact that there's other things that he's saying are as interesting. Um, yeah, it's it's up there with sleep. Yeah. That's not bad as as rankings go. No, it's not. I think sleep is like a remarkably profoundly disturbing and strange. Sleep. And and as are psychedelics. Sleep and dream research. Yeah, that's one of my fantasy alternate professions. Sleep is good. Death is better still. Not to have been born at all is the real miracle. Someone said. Ooh. Very cynical. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. No. Who was that? They weren't very happy. Um, so I, I'm f fascinated with the history of psychedelics, even without, e I find the experience itself kind of terrifying and I wouldn't do it voluntarily too many times. Um, but I do think that just the fact that they exist is amazing uh, and worth thinking about both as a philosopher and as a neuroscientist and as a filmmaker and as just somebody curious about what it is that's going on here. I think um, the, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about the history of, you know, the dis psychedelics in traditional cultures and mm. and then the discovery of LSD by Hoffman. And Ooh. I mean, we could talk for hours about We could all talk this, for hours. You got to focus me. There's too much. There's too much. It's all fascinating. I, I, I love the story of um, there was a now I'm forgetting his name. Was it he was a friend of Aldous Huxley who was running a... Um, Humphrey a, Osmond. Osmond, mm. yes, was running a psychiatric hospital right in Canada. That's right. And he um, and they were calling them at the time, not the word psychedelic didn't exist, it was psychotomimetics because they would mimic psychosis. But mm. they were um, <clears throat> writing back and forth saying that this is such a just misguided word for it. It's not. It doesn't get at how interesting they really are. And so they started writing... Uh, little poems to each other to suggest what it could, what psychedelics, which the word psychedelic didn't exist yet. Um, so I think um, uh, um, Huxley suggested phanerodyne, which is like showing of the mind. And he said, to make this trivial world sublime, take a pinch of phanerodyne. And Osmond thought that that didn't quite strike the chord. But he liked the idea of like manifesting mind. So delos in Greek is to manifest and psyche is is the psyche, the mind. So he wrote back to uh, to uh, sink to hell or soar angelic, take a pinch of psychedelic. And that's how the word psychedelic was born. Something like that. That's exactly. Yeah, I don't think it's sink to hell. I can't quite remember the first phrase, but yeah, exactly. So angelic, or is it, take yeah. a pinch of psychedelic. I know it's a beautiful story and that uh, correspondence, and I love that old-fashioned correspondence between these beautiful erudite um, minds, these psyches, yeah, delosing yeah. each other. <laughs> exactly, and um, I'm trying to think. There's been a lot of um, uh, thought about um, what's the best word, and some people think entheogen. Which means what? Entheo is like God containing. God inside, yeah. Or, also, um, the word of the word, the root of the word enthusiasm mm. is ha containing God inside you. Entheos. Mm. Maybe that's a little too religious for me, though. Mm. I'm glad they didn't go. I mean, entheogen's a nice word. And but. then for MDMA, intactogen is another <clears throat> sort of mm -hmm. word, sort of touchy, touching. Um, yeah, no, there's fantastic characters uh, along the way. I think it's been some really. <clears throat> Um, brave and beautiful people that have um, had these experiences and shared them in the West. And as you mentioned, I think there's also some incredible lineages of um, indigenous and shamanic and traditional use that we probably don't know even slightly a scraping of the surface of. Um, but it's so beautiful and um, there's so much kind of mind-blowing positivity and healing i think from those traditions and from the, the drugs in general i must say that I, for me they've been very profound and you asked me you know why am i interested in them i think it's not just that they're fascinating i honestly think that these experiences have really um formed some kind of fundamental um underlying positivity of reality for me they are sort of my experiences of um sort of affirmed a benign architecture. It, I feel that the goodness of the uh, experience of being alive, the goodness of the universe, whatever it might be, 
um, because of these experiences, which is um, which is not nothing. This is for me the most profound, I think, levels. And my um, amazement at how these medicines have sort of um, helped me in my own personal sort of journey, um, and not, not just for fascination or for certainly not for recreation, but in the most profound. Um, um, sort of both mystical and also sort of mundane ways. It's really stunning. Um, and the fact that these brave researchers are, are suddenly able to do this amazing research. There's so much research that's just blossoming. It's <coughs> going to come online. I think it's really going to change everything in our world. Um, so it's it's really incredible privilege to be surrounded and obsessed with this stuff and kind of get to think about it and talk to all these people so i think i think that there was like a step forward and three steps back made in the 60s by primarily by timothy leary i think was the was both the the great uh you know popularizer and and destroyer he of... gets all the flag i don't know if i quite buy he did he he definitely um he definitely um, gets all the blame. I don't think it was just him. And um, I think that they are profoundly threatening to a culture, yeah. you know. And um, it's no coincidence that they've been suppressed over the years by, you know, I think Christian, early Christian cultures and all kinds of cultures have suppressed them. They're, they're, I think they're incredibly um, well, powerful. They're boundary dissolving and the culture is, uh, this is Terrence McKenna's theory that they since psychedelics primary uh kind of function is to dissolve boundaries if you have a culture that's very defined by boundaries then it's going to be threatened and if you have indigenous cultures that are less boundary defined then they will be able to embrace them more um that was his theory i i, I buy it i think i buy it too yeah um but I, I got to meet one of my favorite minds ever was a guy named Houston Smith. Do you know about him? Of course. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, he used to hang out in Berkeley and I, I went and interviewed him when he was in his nineties. And, um, he said that he was friends with Aldous Huxley too. And he was one of the first people, you know, he was religious studies professor at MIT and, um, interested one of the first people to be interested in far eastern mystical thought and yoga and he had this kind of amazing you can see these on youtube now he had he looked like a marine and he had these uh, this kind of pbs style show where he would sit behind a desk and talk about yoga poses and like sit then sit on the desk and do these poses and um he became interested in the because of his friendship with huxley he became interested in this idea that there that you could have a, a religious experience on call with these substances. Well, that's what the Good Friday experiment, 1962, which he was part of, um, uh, supervised by Leary, a researcher called Walter Pankey, who tragically died in a scuba diving accident after that. But it was a really sort of um, deceptively sort of profound study called the Good Friday Experiment, mm -hmm. and it was the Marsh Chapel at Boston University on Good Friday, 1962. The best Good Friday in 2,000 years for... For half the, the the subjects exactly and the <laughs> other the other half got niacin and uh itched a bit and um it's tough they're very tough to blind placebos don't really cut it with psychedelics you, it's mm -hmm. it's it's tough to disguise some people have done some very clever experimental design to really disguise them but it's tricky to blind double blind with um psychedelics because it's, it's pretty clear right away who got the who got the placebo yeah but um those divinity students you know the fact that they they had, um, you know, what 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 they rated as one of the most profound experiences of their lives, kind of on cue. And the fact that these um, these this is at Harvard, by the way, they gave psychedelics to divinity students. To that's at, right. During uh, at mass to see if they would like it would evoke a, a truer religious experience. That's right. And they have a really interesting mystical experience scale where they kind of rate a mystical experience. And it's not just a sort of fake mystical experience. It's sort of indistinguishable from a real mystical experience. And, and well, and hardcore scientists might think they're all fake, right? If you're a real materialist. Um, Does it worry you even talking about? I mean, it's it, this is the other side of the spectrum. What? The, I mean, are you talking, honing, honing in on the mystical part yeah. of the mystical experience? Yeah. Uh, I mean, you give someone dexamethasone or 
corticosteroids and they have mania and euphoria for days to weeks like it, it doesn't it's it's our president <laughs> <laughs> it's happening to our president That's right so now trump is actually on steroids he's on a hardcore dexamethasone right yep yeah yeah which is just a know. kind of corticosteroid um and and so people have profound experiences for, I guess, uh, people have profound experiences a lot of different ways uh yeah. you 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 can almost drown you can almost die you can have a profound experience because of glutamatergic excitotoxicity when your neurons are exploding um you can you can have temporal lobe epilepsy um I mean, I think it's... There, there is a quantification. There is a scale. There are some hallmarks of the mystical experience. I mean, people, serious minds have tried to quantify these extremely hard to quantify um, experiences. Um, yeah, and, and that they subjectively report that these are, and this is very true for like people in psilocybin studies and various different, various different psychedelic studies, that they report just subjectively this is one of the most profound experiences of their life. And like I give that as much weight as any objective scientific anything. Like that is extremely interesting and extremely like worth worthy of study. Um, and and like I used to have this little martini list I kept in grad school, and I would get everyone who came and I would give a martini to. I would have them rate subjectively and objectively the you know a scale of one to a hundred the martini. And the subjective column is the only interesting and relevant column. So the subjective report of profundity. Um, is really all that there is. And so the fact that these can induce, I mean, I like the entheogen name because it is throughout history, back to the ancient Greece, like, uh, you know, back to all the theories about whether or not kind of various different things were spiked with various LSD-like compounds. Um, and that these were part of either religious um, rituals or part of religious kind of explorations or part of just cultural or emotional just expansion um, part of witch trials there's all kinds of theories linking kind of social aberrance and social kind of um you know outside the norm of thinking to these drugs and i think that's why they're dangerous to society but it's also one of their most remarkable and profound abilities and and you know neuroscience has effectively failed as a field and discipline to cure anything and I think the greatest hope that we have in the coming decades is like the exploration and understanding of of the chemical effects of these drugs because of the profound subjective reports. Yeah. Uh, uh, like if you if you look at the history of how antidepressants kind of came on the market or various different ang anti anti anxiety drugs, the things that are trying to cure what what ails us, right? It's they they started as a drug for something else, and they tend to just be subjective side effect reports. And then people went through and just kind of like pulled out, oh, that person feels a, a more grounded sense of well-being after taking this. And so you pull that subjective report out of all these side effects of these drugs. Mm -hmm. And then you use that as the focus of the, the new focus of the thing. And so I think you're going to you're going to have this in the narrative. Have, yeah, no, these studies are coming online. Yeah, yeah. That um, uh, two doses of uh, uh, psilocybin, magic mushrooms, um, hands down beats the leading antidepressant in the UK, for example. Um, and really just astonishing results for all kinds of things from OCD, P PTSD, smoking cessation, um, eating disorders, um, anxiety, depression, OCD. Um, just amazing. So there, so there was this all this... I want to go back to the historical mm. side because I find it interesting that... So in the 50s, they started very quietly studying these things and they were using LSD no, was, and psychotherapy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Harry was, Grant was doing it. Yeah, lots of research. It, it, we've forgotten about it now, but it wasn't that quiet. It was really interesting and completely legal. Cary yeah. Grant, that's right, some movie stars are doing therapy with uh, LSD. In Beverly Hills, like, like you know, psychoanalyst offices taking their, their weekly LSD dose. And then, so, so, and then Houston Smith... Um, called up his friend Aldous Huxley and said, I want to have one of these on-call religious experiences. And Aldous said, uh, well, there's a young professor at Harvard. He's just been hired, and uh, his name is Tim Leary, and here's his phone number. Call him up, and he'll give you the religious experience. So he calls him up, and they set up a date on a Sunday morning, and Houston Smith and his wife go over and have this, uh, what he said was, what he thought was a veridical religious experience and he said he could feel himself climbing up the great chain of being and that it, at the very top if he if he climbed the last rung he he thought he risked never 
coming back to being just a simple human and he would just be in this you know light and oneness with you know the ultimate being um but then discovered to his delight that you could come back from it and that it just confirmed a bunch of things that he already suspected to be true and then he said he found he didn't find the need to do it again more than once or twice because i think the line was once you've got the message you can hang up the phone and um and he thought it was a little you know uh, counterproductive the fact that these people had to just keep going back to this experience over and over again and then leary as famously we could do a whole episode on his life story is probably one of the most interesting biographies there's a lot of, of the films that come out about him that i'm not making but yeah <laughs> very very interesting stuff but so so yeah. he he you know he was at harvard started you know with his friend and colleague richard alpert later known as student. ramdas yeah student richard albert no he no was, he was a professor too uh, yeah, but professors. he's very much junior. I mean, that's the thing that people forget about Leary was that he was born in 1920. Yeah. So that he was 40 when these came along. And I think that he, he'd been disillusioned um, by the fact that he any uh, psychotherapeutic intervention had been shown to be no better than placebo yeah. by the time that psychedelics no came chance. along. Yeah. And, um, Not so, chance, placebo. No, no. He said he, he. I remember him saying that it was no better than that. That 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 the 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 salutary effects of of therapies was no better than than just random, like uh, even doing nothing was was uh, the same as doing therapies. So yeah. that's why when he's when Still he took no proven benefit, nothing that they could do in psychiatry or psychology actually helped. As a yeah. psychologist, he sort of his whole field was sort of had been just proven completely futile when these things came along and i don't blame him for getting overexcited about their potential uh, i think he gets a bad rap because he was sort of such a you know fantastic talker and he he did get sloppy with the science and so forth and so forth but he he's he definitely became a proselytizer yeah i mean he yeah, would just kind right. of like he would and if you listen now how radical his like speeches were and like once he got fired from harvard and and um That's you know right. he would he would like if you if you listen now it's it's quite shocking the things that he would he, he would fill up theaters of you know thousands of people listening to him and he would advocate for everybody quitting their job everybody Turn leave on, school in, drop out. yeah nobody over 40 should be allowed to vote um it was quite you know it, it was i think throwing away the baby with the bathwater. but at the yeah. time there was this sense that there was nothing worth keeping of the last you know thousands of years of western civilization because it was so rigid you know and um I think now we're we have a more nuanced take on it and we're not looking to just explode we're, we're i think there's a sense that we can keep some of the good things of uh that we've built up over the last few thousand years and that we can carefully question those boundaries push at those boundaries and that's the big difference i think yeah no that's right he he he, he certainly did overstep i um that's right that's right that's right um, and that censorship of science, though, that Nixon called him the most dangerous man in America, which says a lot. Um, I didn't know about the theater's part. That's new. I thought he was sort of at this big house in upstate New York, Millbrook. Um, uh, he did that from like 63 to 65, 66. And he and Ram Dass kind of fell out. And, you know, Albert, who changed his name to Ram Dass, goes to India. Who I've made a film about, or I executive produced a beautiful film called Ram Dass Going Home about. We it's have amazing. so much in common. I oh, produced yeah? a film called Dying to Know about Ram Dass and Lyric. Did you? Last, I love that uh, film. Last Which Gay directed. Yeah, That's yeah. right. I didn't know you did. Yeah. That's a beautiful film. I love that film. That's an amazing film. So I think we, another important have, context of like the early 60s also is that the, so in 1949, uh, the Nobel Prize was given for the lobotomy, right? So we're uh -huh. talking about the ways in which the field is trying to come to terms with its either failures and successes, right? And so the degree, like, a lot of a lot of ways that people talk about modern pharmaceuticals is kind of like micro ECT electroconvulsive therapy or micro lobotomies in a way that it's at the synapse level instead of this crude kind of ice pick level. And so I think a lot of this, like the context of the uh, at the time though in this in the early '60s, like it was controversial but still not yet kind of barbaric. And so there's a really interesting like physical versus chemical, right? You're going in uh, like kind of um, uh, theme to the kinds of logic that people have about this. Okay, this seems so much safer. You don't have to go in through the eyes with a freaking ice hook. Yeah. You can actually take yeah. like a small, tiny, tiny bit of thing that seems like it just 
would be easier and better. And so these aren't, or, or my, my understanding they of the history. Selectively, they operate very selectively on the brain. That's what's amazing. For example, MDMA really selectively extinguishes the fear um, response. So you can really, but leaving the rest of the faculties intact. Because alcohol, you know, will, will reduce the fear, but it will also um, suppress lots of other things along. And same thing with the, um, the they're showing with the fMRI studies that you suppress the default mode network. Um, and they're learning a lot about how some of these um, mechanisms of action and even actually shedding light actually on ECT, which nobody really understood how ECT worked. It just yeah, seemed to no. work sometimes for people. Um, but I think now they're starting to understand it more. And I think about um, the suppression of science that Nixon banned because of the uh, Vietnam War and the counterculture and that all this extremely promising science um, that was being done and all these um, incredibly important experiences that say Steve Jobs, uh, you know, credits one of the most important experiences of his life. Um, Bill Wilson, who founded AA, um, yeah. got sober and founded AA because of an LSD trip, for example. All these like they, don't, they leave that out of the 12 steps now a lot. Kind of, they, they're uncomfortable with the fact that he actually advocated for the use of LSD. Yeah. That right. something worked. That's yeah. right. No, and it's um, uh, I could go on and on about that, but yeah. So basically, when the science really got um, uh, stopped, um, there's a great quote uh, by this wonderful British uh, scientist called David Nutt, who says it's the greatest suppression of science since the Catholics but banned the telescope in 1612 or is it 1616? Um, but really, it is this enormous. It, it is. It, it, it was a little bit like Galileo and the telescope. You know, it really, um, the, the science was really um, completely suppressed and really buried. I mean, it, the, the fact that this research is being unearthed. And if you think about the years of the fifty years of research that we've lost and what we'd have learned by now, and all the treatments that we'd have by now, if if um, the scientists had been allowed to keep working um, and Thank goodness that it's all, you know, hopefully returning now, and I hope it keeps going. There's, uh, so, so Houston Smith called it empirical metaphysics, which I love as a phrase for what psychedelics do. And that's the kind of outward-looking idea of what does it tell us about the world and, like, metaphysical reality and a kind of philosophical tool. And then you've got the kind of introspective tool, uh, or a microscope that it's that it's allowing for this uh, look at you know your own psychology um and then there's the kind of the the neuroscientific view which maybe treads both of those um I don't know. It's just interesting. They're they're interesting on so many levels. They're interesting philosophically. They're, diff they're interesting yeah, psychologically, they're yeah. spiritually. And I think that that kind of the fact that they 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 tread all these different domains is what makes it both fascinating and uncomfortable for a scientist to look at probably. So if you get stung by a bee and your leg starts swelling, if you get stung on the ankle and your leg starts swelling, that you'll go into the doctor and they'll give you maybe an antibiotic if it doesn't look good. But they'll also give you prednisone, right? Mm -hmm. Which is another steroid, which in 10 to 20% of people causes psychosis. Uh, you then you can have other kinds of dexamethasone and other courts and uh, you'll get this mania and euphoria. Why is it the case that you, those don't get elevated as God enabling or God manifesting drugs. Well, they're not. They're not the same experiences. They're that you know mania is a different experience. But it's euphoria and mania. So, but well, I mean, in, in one. There, is a, there is a mystical experience scale, and there are several. Um, there are several. Uh, there are several um, aspects to the mystical experience on the classical mystical experience um, scale. Do you have oceanic boundlessness? For example, Ooh. is there ineffability? <laughs> for Ooh. example, there are several, um, like you know, there are several, uh, there are, there are several boxes to check, and um, you know, euphoria is um, not one of them. It feels like it's on the same scale of everyday experience, just exaggerated. Whereas psychedelics seem like fundamentally or different thogonal. type of experience. That if you haven't had the experience, is all it's almost impossible to describe. It seems like you're getting a just a fundamentally different experience of consciousness but the um, prednisone induced psychosis is a fundamentally different experience 
right? Yeah. If you if you give someone L dopa for a long enough time, tiny, tiny, tiny amount of L dopa, which then gets converted into dopamine in the brain, of which there are very, very few neurons. The physical effect of this is extraordinarily small, but they will also go psychotic. But yeah, and the psychosis, I guess, also has such a, a profound negativity. Well, but, I but, think but Hoffman's as big a scientist, thing, when he you don't... his bicycle ride, he was uh, amazed by how it was temporary and surprisingly pleasant. This like the... not originally the original bicycle ride, he was terrified. He was terrified. He was. He, uh, yeah, yeah, I he was thought just, he was dying. I, right? I, 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 I know all about this. Yeah, no, he <laughs> thought he was dying, and he thought he'd yeah. made a terrible mistake, and he had three young kids, and he had absolutely no, you know, he, he, he didn't think that he'd taken a. Uh, dose that would ha affect him in any way because um, it, it's so astoundingly potent yeah. that he took the tiniest a quarter of a milligram, dose. which is like a huge dose of, of LSD. He had yeah. no idea it would go away ever. Yeah. That yeah. might have just he might just be fixed you like know, he that. He thought yeah. he was going to die, and then um, or had died, and then yeah. when he uh, no, he was pretty sure he was cycling home, but he cycled home and he um, went to get a glass of milk, and. Um, uh, that didn't work as a sort of non-specific antidote. And his son always said, no, my daddy always wanted milk for everything. But yeah, so we, a glass of milk didn't work. So we called for the family doctor, expecting fully that his vital signs would be off the charts bad. And the doctor's like, there's absolutely nothing wrong with you, except for that, you know, your mind. And um, that's the other startling thing, is how remarkably safe these substances are, that LSD could do so much to your mind and you know not not do anything to your body at all um and then after that he started to enjoy it the next morning he thought it was sort of fun but it was initially absolutely terrifying i imagine yeah that, and you can imagine if you didn't know what it was but i think it's interesting that that was one of the original purposes wasn't it back to the history that that, that originally they, they thought of it as like you said a psychotomimetic meaning that it mimicked psychosis so they thought it was a tool to you could you could sort of give people a sort of temporary reversible uh, experience of psychosis in order to study it um it didn't quite work out that way but that was the kind of initial line of sort of justification for research was let's examine psychosis by giving people these psychotomimetics um yeah i could go on and on i don't know though it's 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 a lot it's a lot it's a lot and i just recommend that um you know people educate themselves and uh and seek out very safe and there are risks so people shouldn't take risks but people seek out um very safe um, experiences if they are curious. Um, are you at all concerned about the kind of commodification of the ayahuasca experience, for example, amongst like, you know, yuppies in New York and the, 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 all this like, you know, the, 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 it's become a big business, I think, the shamanism and everything. I've, I, I, I see it as an area of concern. Well, I think there's always tackiness in the world that I don't like in any in any area of life, right? And um, especially when things that you care about and seem important and sacred to many people um, are sort of commodified. It's it's awkward, but other people would say, um, "Hey, you know, we haven't had access. We can't afford to go to Peru and stay in expensive retreat centers." What about us? You know, there's some really interesting um, arguments going on around access to some new stuff. For example, a, a really fascinating movement called Decriminalized Nature. And um, who really point out how racist the drug laws are and how access to these naturally growing substances, so how these mushrooms can grow or these cactuses, uh, San Pedro can grow, but you can't eat them without it breaking the law. And that these medicines are um, actually really, um, you know, healing and t t traditionally used as such. What 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 laws are there that are stopping us doing that? And I think that um, also some people who are sort of medicalizing or commodifying or bringing, you know, trying to sort of mass bring a mass experience. I think there's going to be some bad examples that there might be even some um, dodgy or you know sexually sort of predatorial sort of um really unfortunate stuff happening although i think that the risks on, on that get stated perhaps more than any I don't, I don't i don't hear about that actually happening although people talk about the risks of that happening quite a lot and i'm sure that the risk will increase as use increases but part of me is also really 
I don't want to judge. I, I, I am really interested. I was talking to an amazing black therapist um, who's saying, you know, um, you know, when you talk about treatment resistant depression, you're assuming that that people have had treatment and people don't have access to any of this stuff. Don't don't assume that it's wrong to hold up access. So I think there's lots of perspectives out there. I don't know. The other a great late elder statesman of the psychedelic world I got to hang out with and interview was uh, Sasha Shulgin. Mm. And um, he he was like a, a chemist, you know, straight up, you know, scientist working for, I, I don't remember if it was Dow Chemical or one of the great, one of the big kind of corporate chemical companies. And on the weekends or at home in his little lab, he was got into designing his own psychedelics and he also dug up an old recipe from like the 1920s in germany for mdma and like it had been completely forgotten and he resynthesized it and um and then he wrote this book because he would he would he would first test them on himself because he didn't want to be responsible for hurting anybody and once he realized that they were the toxicity was safe then he would invite like seven or eight of his best friends over on a Sunday and give it to them and then ask them to write reports on all these like hundreds of varieties of like uh, he, the, the book that one of the books he wrote is called Tikal and it's written it's T-I-K-H-A-L and it looks like it's written in some kind of Native American font and you think it must be some word for some uh, some Native American word for these uh, experiences mm. but actually it stands for tryptamines I have known and loved. And, um, and there's the follow-up for Nethlamines I've known and I loved. I have known and loved. Pical. Pical and Tikal. And I highly recommend this, mm. these books um, of these, uh, you know, these these first-hand accounts of what these experiences are like. Because they can be very specific, too. I remember reading one was just audio hallucinations. And one was like, everything was normal, but time was out of order. Um, and it just to me, it just points at how contingent our everyday experiences i think you disagreed with this but i think like it just seems to be based on a kind of almost not random but like highly contingent architecture of the way our brains happen to be set up if changing it can change so much the world it seems to, to me that it a logical conclusion of that is that the way the world shows up is based on how the chemical setup of our brains if just perturbing it a little bit alters that so much. Reality is controlled hallucination. Exactly. Exactly. I just want to make you a look worried. No, I just want to make a footnote that I just well, find he's looking to Patrick because yeah. you know more about this. I stuff clearly don't. Clearly do, I clearly don't. And, and we so talk about reality is controlled hallucination. We can talk about, um, I just want a small foot yeah, what's your footnote? Top down. I just want a small footnote about how incredibly it's hard to take stock of what you have and what is available to you sometimes you just kind of are thrown into this generation at this time and it, it, but we have like just even the the simplicity of the fact that we have someone went out and found and synthesized MDMA right they found it in a German chemist's like notebook um, we have what is a like the things that we have available to us now are effectively like thousands of years of like sought after magic and like the Chinese emperors went to war over and call, tried, you know, tried to colonize the world. We have, we have MDMA, which is basically like Cupid's arrow, right? And we effectively have Cupid's arrow actually. Uh, 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 we have like Tylo. Yeah, it's not Cupid's arrow. It, I mean, it can be, I mean, it's an intimacy and a kind of connection and, and Empathy. you can. And it was specifically. It well, maybe that's what keeps it there. I mean, it's, it's. I'm not, I don't even, think it's pure erotic by any means, but I mean, I think it, it, it has aspects of Cupid's arrow, right? It has yeah. the kind of thing of people take heart. it to, yeah, to open their heart about an individual. It's a beautiful analogy. Yeah. No, no, it's a suggestive analogy. It's true. And I'm we sure. have, we have ground up rhino horn, you know, uh, the equivalent, the, the, the functional equivalent of ground up rhino horn. We have Viagra, we have MDMA, we have Cupid's arrow, we have Tylenol, which reduces existential dread if you're a little bit hungover i think about this all the time in like deadwood era days when you just had no um you just had nothing available to you like what do you do about the kind of ravages of, of daily change and we just have all these things actually truly available to us yeah. we can we can if we want to obliterate our body schema in a very controlled way if you take like intranasal euketamine you know we have we have actual pain relievers that work like the only problem we have actual sleeping aids that work and the only problem is actually like titrating uh how effective they truly are mm. 
-hmm. We can sleep on command. We can feel no pain on command. We can dissociate our sense of self on command. We can have Cupid's arrow on command. We can have, you know, rhino horn on command. It's ridiculous that we actually have these things available to us. And yet still we have like an increase in existential angst and anxiety and depression. Everything's amazing and nobody's happy. No, but that's that's where that's where the psychedelics could potentially come in. I mean, that's the interesting thing about the studies that they're doing with psychedelics for, um, uh, people with cancer, for example, people with advan- advanced cancer diagnoses, you know, we can take care of all their physical symptoms for the most part, but what you can't take care of is the anxiety or the depression or the sort of existential dread that you might fear with a really difficult diagnosis looming over you or death approaching. And the, the, the studies are looking at how a single dose of psilocybin, for example, can really uh, shift people to being able to enjoy the time that they have left and be relieved of these symptoms. I think that is incredible. And so I think that we can think of these psychedelic substances as potentially these you know, fascinating new class of drugs that actually do open up the um, opportunity to be happier, to heal some of the absolutely hardest to treat conditions because we haven't been able to um treat anxiety depression to some extent a little bit but not for all people and not um you know without side effects with ssris etc um ocd eating disorders i mean these are really the notoriously hard to treat conditions that we don't have any good therapeutics for if if it was cancer you know think about the strides we've made in cancer compared to psychiatry in recent years. I mean, people are really suffering. People are coming back. They've survived the war and they're killing themselves. Why? This is tragic. And now these medicines, I think that's, that's why I get really partly, it's just one of the reasons, but it's an incredible reason to get incredibly excited about these drugs. They're mm-hmm. going to really help so many people and right who for right now, we do not have anything and they help them so shockingly well that it's like having a surgery. I wonder though, how much of our, of our, just love of these things is based on the fact that they are somewhat transgressive and not embraced by the pharmaceutical companies. Had they come up with it first, we'd probably be a lot more suspicious. Like if they'd come up with this, you know, the MDMA and said, oh, we've got this thing that will heal PTSD and do this and do that. And then, you know, they were and it was being sold by the pharmaceutical companies and encouraged, the, you know, they encouraged the doctors to, to give it to patients and everything. The very same people who are embracing it would probably be saying like, be careful. The pharmaceutical companies have something up their sleeve. It's, uh, it's so maybe, question. maybe we yeah, want... they will soon be, they will soon be having the challenge of marketing MDMA mm, to people yeah. Yeah. And, and ketamine because uh, MDMA yeah. is set to be, you know, that it's in face marijuana right Marlboro's, but I think may getting in the mar- marijuana or Coca-Cola are getting in the marijuana business. And, you know, once it becomes the big industrial crop and, and pharmaceutical drug and packaged and oh, sold and commodified. Turn off. I don't but know. cocaine, amphetamine, heroin, those were all, those kind of all started as pharmaceutical drugs. Right? Miracles too. Well, that, like, yeah. you know, they were considered great, even heroin, right? Like right. Bayer heroin, like it's the, was the non-addictive uh, alternative to morphine. Uh, it was marketed as such. So I'm sure that all of these substances, once you package and sell them, we're going to find all their their benefits and also their... I don't think there's a panacea. I don't think like... I've, I've done enough psychedelics to understand that I think that there's, there's great benefit, but also great risk. And I think that there's... Um, I think there's also something we, to be should, said, we have to be careful to, not to deify them a little I think bit. that's right and you always have to state the risks but I think it's also worth noting that there's actually you know they're showing a really substantial difference between recreational therapeutic usage so it, it really works and actually for your point you know about Cupid's arrow um, uh, Patrick some people who take um, MDMA for example what might come up was actually a lot of really traumatic material from their memory for example it may not be um ec- ecstasy you know it yeah. could actually be um really and the come down is real that's a debate that people have that is a debate studies keep consistently show that it's um actually staying up all night and the other stuff you might take alongside mdma it's that true. actually will get you and that there isn't the tuesday blues that are actually kind of um um it's true if you take it without alcohol and you take it in the morning i think actually it, you know it's much less bad than we might think. But the fact that we're talking about this in anecdote is exactly the problem, right? Right. That would, that there hasn't been the decades of study on this, right? That that yeah. should that should be determined already. I think they will be yeah. soon. Yeah, I th- but no, th- I think people have looked at it. There are there are some studies, and they've no, nobody's ever shown it. Um, 
I think. But it's interesting because it's, it's very, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about it, yeah. So what are you allowed to tell us about your movie? Anything? No, series. nothing. Zero. Yeah, series. Zero. Not movie, series. Sorry, series. Yeah, nothing. Even yeah. not allowed. Uh, just that I'm obsessed with it and, and I am just obsessed and with it. And something will be coming one day. <laughs> I hope. You never know. That's the other thing. That's the other reason to shut up about things is you never actually know when you're making things what's actually going to happen because that's the crazy world that we live in. But um, I'll just say that I've been obsessed. I felt very lucky to have um, had cyclic experiences starting from when I was a teenager that have been really meaningful for me and um, that that it's I can't think of anything more fascinating and to get to explore and talk to these amazing researchers. It's a really exciting time in the world for this sort of stuff. And it's, I, I don't know, I can't, I, I, it's boring to talk generally, isn't it? So I won't bore you, but, um, but it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick, do you have any closing thoughts? I, I kind of want to know, and I, I think it's worth talking about. So like I'm, I'm, I have reserva like I have I have a certain amount of skept skepticism as the you know professional neuroscientist and there's a branding thing et cetera et cetera but then I also have something that I think is detached from that which is to me a first principled argument about the kinds of things that society talks about and the trade offs that we make in terms of availability versus consequence right availability to entire populations versus the consequence and like. I, so the, the way that I think about it, I, I personally know people who went on a bender and broke their brain. Yeah. And these, the one person in particular is in and out of psychiatric institutions. Maybe she was already on her way. Um, maybe not. Uh, and so when, when I think about this and I think about the difference between physical pain and psychic pain, I think about, um, we, we've decided that like cigarettes are now okay. We've, we've had all kinds of versions of prohibition, right? Yeah. And uh, we, cigarettes are now freely available, highly taxed, but freely available. Alcohol is mostly available to some subset of our population. And we kind of allow the ones that cannot hold themselves accountable or have a physical addiction to go too far. And they end up in hospitals and they end up with delirium tremens. They end up with cirrhosis of the liver. They end up with lung cancer. And we just kind of, you know, allow a certain percentage of the population to maybe take individual responsibility for their own actions and end up severely sick and diseased. And then the question is for certain kinds of psychedelics, um, you know, I, I most care about and started my kind of neuroscientific career interested in schizophrenia. And in part, it's because it's something I understood the least. I thought it was interesting in the exact same way that the telescope idea about psychedelics is interesting. I thought schizophrenia was an interesting perturbation and an interesting break of the brain that might tell us something about the normal functioning. And <clears throat> there are some people who, if they do psychedelics, if they perhaps do certain kinds way too often or in the improper environments or in the improper context, in the same way that you might if you know if you're a multi pack a day smoker you're going to end up possibly in the hospital if you're a multi liter a day drinker you might end up with delirium mm. tremens or in the hospital so like how do you weigh how do we as a society weigh the difference between the physical and the psychic pain because there is no other thing in the history of societal trade off about uh, um, availability where the consequence has been psychosis and schizophrenia yes but i yes, know someone but. with marijuana who who i i find marijuana the strongest drug i've ever tried i find it terrifying i would i, I oh, yeah, there's I there's few things there's i amongst the like five worst experiences of my life i would say smoking marijuana is one of them i would rather be yeah. dosed with lsd than have that experience now it's freely available and i too know somebody a dear friend who who had it too much and ended up the, with permanent uh, psychological issues from it and yeah. i can't imagine these poor kids that are like now having all this access to it and of course it's great and of course it's a, just a plant and of course it, I, I i i'm my libertarian instincts anarchist instincts are, it's are just a plant what, what do you mean just a plant mean it's it's not like it's not going through a laboratory right it's like uh it's just growing there innocently enough <laughs> You, um, you can, I have you some can... way about marijuana. People actually often confuse because I am very pro psychedelic. People often think that I would be someone that uses a lot of cannabis, and I just don't. 
and I don't really get along with it. And I think that's a, it, it's very interesting. I have a friend, um, a dear friend from high school who used a, a ton of cannabis and also had an LSD trip. And unfortunately, and he had a psychotic break and unfortunately he's not healed and he's still um, institutionalized still. And I'm so, I'm very conscious of those risks. And, and it's really important to state the risks and studies will um, typically exclude anyone with a first degree relative with um, uh, bipolar disorder that's one of the sort of that's the headline exclusion criteria for any of these studies um, although I think people will actually start to look at it as potential therapeutic uh, f ironically um, so hold that thought but um, the there's a couple of interesting factoids one is that in societies which regularly use psychedelics there is no higher rate of schizophrenia than in other populations and with all the use that has happened it there's been no high there's been no population data you know all the people that used it in the 60s for example the, the, there was no population data that could ever um, make that causal connection because another thing that happens is people experiment with these um, substances exactly at the period of life where these diseases emerge yeah, As you absolutely. know schizophrenia emerges um, in you know, um, in, in uh, young uh, people, and so it's really hard to say if it um, uh, provokes it or um, might be coincident with it um, coming uh, c coming apparent. And so I think that's something that obviously people have to really, um, and it and it certainly gives me. Um, tremendous pause and I think that that's that's important but I think that the opportunity for astonishing healing is so in unbelievably promising it is that there's the results are stunning there's never been results I don't think I sound like President Trump now there's never been results <laughs> like this I, but they don't think they have these are these are the wonder drugs of psychiatry and um, yes there are caveats yes there are risks but how how could we uh, refuse this call to um, understand because I think of yes there may be people that have um, hurt but I think of say Bill Wilson and the and the addiction so many people have actually already experienced great benefit even without the benefit of the therapy with so, um, but how do we make the utilitarian uh, comparison right because that's a utilitarian argument that that maybe there's more good and I, and I I'm fully open and probably and I do believe that there is more good that than harm that will come from this but I do not know how to calculate the cost of a single mind that breaks that, right. that enters into psychosis if, if someone has cirrhosis of the liver i can kind of like calculate on and quantify their pain on some level you, you kind of get it it's a certain amount of months mm. for a certain amount of time they're in the or people, there's how many people commit suicide because of depression um you know every day and um yeah, how many people it's commit on the rise. Suicide? There is argument he how was, many people I, I, commit suicide because of ptsd and then there's a lot i mean these these statistics are absolutely um horrible and and you can't I, I wouldn't want to be in that business of making those comparisons. Yeah, Larry said Larry was saying that he that, that, that people are more likely by percentage wise to commit suicide because of going to college than because of taking L S D because there's a certain percentage of freshmen in college would jump out of windows, you know, and uh so you'd say that it's actually safer than a, than a, a four-year um, college, college education. Um, my favorite... It's uh, tricky business, the statistical stuff. My favorite, you know? David Nutt, my favorite researcher in the UK, David Nutt, has, has, has did a great um, study where he compared horse riding with MDMA and pointed out that horse riding was more dangerous, which got him in, uh, hmm. fired from uh, his position. But he's absolutely right. You know? Yeah. No, I remember and I, I, I interviewed a... Uh, a woman, Dr. Susan Block, who's like uh, advocates for open sexuality. And I said, what, what about what about the dangers of sex of like, you know, diseases and stuff like that? And she said, well, I did the math and it's, you know, it's it's much it's not quite as safe as flying in an airplane, but it's a little safer than driving in a car. So and, and just like a car, you know, you put on a seatbelt to mitigate your risk. You know, you can mitigate your risks also right, but, and but these things, you know, the adverse outcome here is physical pain or death or fatality. Right. It's Versus yes, it's safer psychosis. than horse riding. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, it's safer than horse riding. Uh, but it's it's because we do not have the tools or methods to quantify what psychic pain actually is and does to a person you could uh, you could imagine that you want zero cases in the world of that like it's a it's a it's a no tolerance policy it's for psychosis bad, yeah. 
if it is that bad. If it we we have there's what eight billion human minds in potentially the entirety of the goddamn universe. Like, do, do what is the quantified effect of harming a few? What is the quantified effect of 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 saving a few? I mean, like, I don't. I'm not advocating on either end of this equation. I just do not know how to make the proper comparison. And I think it's hard. You know, we, we, we have this, yeah, we, we've, our country has made kinds of questions about this where we've compared various kind of treatments to autonomy and freedom as we deinstitutionalized our mental hospitals. And, you know, like we are always making kinds of trade-offs between independence, freedom, and a kind of like fixer upperness. Well, like, well, how do we, how do we do this? And I just, I just don't know the terms of the conversation. But the great thing is, the really, the the studies are really showing like n- no adverse instances, and this is really that I'm aware of. Nothing bad has gone wrong, which is really makes we don't have to worry that stuff. Yeah, I'm speaking. Amazing. I'm speaking yeah. an anecdote, and I don't yeah. want to be right. Yeah. But but yeah. we still are. We're Everyone still compares are. their anecdotes, and this is not the way that science moves forward. And so I fully am all in on like pure scientific Manhattan Project style thing. And like, yeah. On that note, I think we're, we're an hour and five minutes in. Probably have to go and work. by the way, on that Manhattan Project idea, you can end a war by splitting an atom. So the idea of like size. Or start one. Or start one. Uh, but, the, but the idea of like the effect of the small microgram of a molecule on the yeah. psyche, you can end a war by splitting an atom. Like the size is not proportional to the effect. And that is true for uh, physics and neuroscience. I have to, you know, avoid saying wonderful things I've heard recently because they belong to my work. But um, we can we can edit the uh, YouTube description once the series comes out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Lucy. That was fun. That was so fun. See you tomorrow, the next day, or the next day, or the next day. Bye. <laughs> um, 